Hi, I'm Jackson Crawford. I'm an Old Norse specialist, previously teaching at several universities and now presenting on YouTube, supported by my generous community of Patreon donors in presenting all manner of topics in Norse language, myth, sagas, runes, etc. for anyone who wants to know about them without an agenda. Uh, today I'm going to continue one of my, not exactly patented, but uh, accustomed summaries of an Icelandic saga. A part of the reason why I make these summaries is that people approaching reading these sagas often do so without being ready for how convoluted and weird Old Norse storytelling is from our perspective. And one of the main things is that even in very short stories, there are tons of characters that get introduced in weird times and places. Um, and then sometimes you dwell on some really minor character uh, for a long time and that distracts the reader, but then you come back to some major character that isn't even drawled on that long. It can get confusing. So the reason I do these summaries, both on YouTube and previously in my classes, is to make reading them more approachable by breaking them down into their kind of most meaningful, from our storytelling sense, parts, so that you can approach their storytelling a little bit better informed and ready. So today I'm looking at the saga Finbogi the Strong, uh, Finboga Saga Rama, and uh, this is a relatively short saga with little in the way of poetry, which is a little bit different. A lot of the short sagas are focused on big poet characters like Bjorn or Gunlaug. And uh, I am going to be dealing probably with a little bit of wind noise, so just be aware of that. I live in a windy place. It's impossible to escape. And uh, just possibly I'm going to get buzzed by the ravens again. <laughs> All right, so our story starts with a Gothi, or chieftain, judge, local leader in Iceland named Osbjorn. And Osbjorn, like so many leaders of ancient Icelandic society, has left his home in Norway because of the consolidation of power under King Harald Fairhair there. Now in Iceland, his wife and he have an adult daughter named Thorny, and a guy that Osbjorn doesn't particularly like comes and asks Osbjorn if he can marry his daughter Thorny. Remember, it's the father that's going to make that decision for a daughter. Osbjorn refuses, but the next summer, when Osbjorn rides off to the Althing, right, the National Parliament slash Festival of Iceland held in the summer, his wife uh, kind of sneakily goes behind his back and allows Thorny to run off with this guy that Osbjorn doesn't like. So, Osbjorn comes back really upset with his wife, and the next year, when he's going to go to the summer all thing, she's very advanced in pregnancy and likely to give birth to her child while he is away at the all thing. And so to punish her for what she did with uh, this other child, he says, you are going to have to expose this child. Uh, in Old Norse, he says, skal bera ut theta barn. One shall, one must. Uh, this is often how obligatory statements are phrased. Expose this child, carry it out, bear it out. What that means is that the infant is not given a name, it's taken outside and left to die uh, from the elements or from an animal or something like that. A practice of many ancient societies. So he goes away and his wife, Thorgerther, stays behind. Sure enough, gives birth to a healthy baby boy. So she's very reluctant to expose this child but she's afraid of her husband, so she takes the child into the interior, the uninhabited, hostile interior of Iceland, and leaves it behind in a cave. But it so happens that near-ish to this cave, there lives her poor foster mother, who is named Sirpa. And you can tell we're supposed to kind of think about this character in terms of her social status, because her name basically means dust bunny lady. And Sirpa notices this healthy young boy and uh, kind of pulls at her heartstrings. And so she takes him home. And she and her husband, Gester, decide they're going to raise the child, even though Gester uh, is kind of skeptical about the possibility they're doing that because he says no one will believe 
that you are the child's mother because you're very ugly and this is a beautiful, healthy child. This is a very typical thing in the sagas. The Norse are very classist about appearance and good looks. They expect wealthy people to be good looking and poor people to be bad looking. And this is supposed to, you know, make it suspicious when you have the sort of uh, uh, ugly ducking situation, right? Same thing happens in Ragnar's saga with the daughter of Sigurdr, the slayer of Falfnir, um, who is called Krokor Oslan. Anyway, Sirpa names the baby boy Urdar Kotr, meaning cat Kotr of the Scree, which is where she found him. Um, this is our hero, by the way. This is the Finbogi the Mighty of, this, of the saga's title. Uh, he just doesn't have that name yet, so we'll see how he gets that name later. Now, he grows up in the typical way for a saga hero. He's better looking than everybody else, and he seems to be twice his age at every age that he reaches. So when he's three, he looks six. Once he's six, he looks 12, etc. And he actually frequently attends feasts and such at the home of his real parents, Olsbjorn and Thorgerther, because since they're the uh, wealthy landowners in the area, their home is kind of a social center for the area. So... One day when he's over there, his mother's brother, his real biological mother's brother, Thorgeir, notices this boy and asks him, uh, who are your parents? And he says, Gestler and Sirpa. And Thorgeir just can't believe it because they're too ugly to have a good-looking child like this. So he asks, Gest, uh, he asks um, Urda Kotr to go and get his parents. He brings Gestler and Sirpa there. Thorgeir asks them, you know, is this really your kid? And they confess, no, we found uh, this baby that was being exposed and took it in. And he says, I wonder who the real mother is. And at that point, his sister Thorgeir that confesses that it's her. So Thorgeir says that the right thing to do would be for Osbjorn and Thorgeir there to raise their own child and to pay a handsome bounty of sorts to uh, Gester and Sirpa for raising um, the kid. And so they do. And so now uh, Ruther Korsher is going to live with his parents and he's going to continue to be a really awesome kid. Uh, he's stronger than everybody else. You know, he's better looking than everybody else. Uh, on one really notable occasion, he drags a shark to shore that nobody else is strong enough to drag. Uh, when he's 12, he single-handedly kills a vicious bull in a wrestling contest. He does all kinds of rock and roll stuff. But now Ruther Korsher is a real night owl and he stays out a lot later than everybody else. And one night he's watching the ocean when he sees a light far out at sea and wonders what it might be. He wakes up his dad, Osbjorn, and they look at it and they agree it might be some kind of a distress signal from a ship out there. So Urda Kultur gets some of the men from the farm together in a boat and they row out there and they find that indeed it's a sinking ship and that uh, some of the men in the wreckage had lit um, a fire to try to get the attention of someone on shore. And it worked. So Urda Kultur and uh, the other farmhands save the guys from the shipwreck who are still alive and their leader and captain is a man named Finbogi. Now Finbogi does die later on on shore. I can't remember why he dies if he gets sick or something like that but because Ur the culture was so generous to him before he breathes his last breath he bequeaths all of his property much of which Ur the culture recovered from the ship and his name to Urda Kultur. So now our hero is officially Finbogi, uh, as the saga is named for him. And I'll come right back and tell you about his adventures with the name that he'll have for the rest of his life, after a quick word from my sponsor. So at 16, our hero, Finbogi, remember this is previously or the culture, uh, arranges passage on a merchant ship to Norway. He's going to go abroad and prove himself in the typical fashion of young Icelandic men in the sagas. But the ship wrecks off the shore of far northern Norway in Hålogaland, and the only survivor is Finbogi himself. Now, he is uh, taken in by a local leader named Borther, 
And Borther tells him, among other things, that in this district of Norway, there is a huge bear that Borther has outlawed because the bear is such a problem, kills livestock and men. And he says that uh, the next morning, at some point, not right after Finborg gets there, he's going to put together a posse and they're going to go kill this bear in the cave that it lives in. Well, Finbogi, being the night owl that he is, wakes up that night before the posse is going to go out in the morning to, to attack this bear, and uh, goes to the cave where he finds the bear is eating uh, sheep that it has, quote unquote, stolen and eaten. And he says to the bear, Statu up, besi, ok rov moti mer, er that helder til nokers, en ligia o sauderslitrit desu. Stand up, berry. <laughs> Bessie is like a familiar way of s talking to a bear, <laughs> which is strange to say. I guess it's what the puppy is to dog, Bessie is to Bjorn, bear, and Old Norse. So stand up, berry, and fight me. That is more worth something than lying on this killed sheep. Well, the bear stands up, looks at him, and then lies back down. Well, Finbogi takes this as a message, and he says, Now, if there thicker ek of mjok vopnother mot there, thor skalek thwi gera. He says, if, you, if it seems to you that I am uh, overarmed versus you, then I will do something about that. So he takes off his helmet, sets down his shield, and he continues, statu nu up ev thu thorir. Stand up if you dare. <laughs> uh, I've definitely had conversations like this with animals. The bear stands up, shakes its head, and it lies back down. And so Vinbogi now says, Well, that skilek thu vil at vitsem yavin bunir. Now I understand that you want us to be equally armed, equally prepared. So he throws his sword away and he says, Swal skalvera sem thu vil ok stat nu up ef thu hevir that hjarta sem liklik vari helder thesk fikvindis er ragaster. So, It'll be as you want. Stand now up if you have a heart that, uh, if you have a heart that is of the uh, likely kind, right, a bear, rather than that of the animal that is most rager or arger. Rager or arger is the ultimate abuse word in Old Norse. It applies any kind of uh, unmasculine attribute, right, cowardice, weakness, etc. So now they fight and wrestle. Sure enough, Finbogi breaks its back. Then he goes home, back to board this place. So in the morning, Finboy wakes up the rest of the Borther's posse. They go to the cave and they find this bear with its back broken. And uh, Borther thinks he knows who did this. He says, I think it was you, Finboy. And Finboy says, well, it doesn't quote him exactly. He says, Finboy seger ok bider han havathat furisat er han vil. Finboy says and asks him to have it for truth what he wants. So Finboy is not going to brag. He's not that kind. Yeah, if you think I broke this bear's back, sure. You can believe that. Right? Understated. Well, his next adventure is he agrees to help a passing trader named Olver uh, on his way down to Trondheim. So he tags along on his boat, and uh, the first night, uh, it's a several days' journey, they stay in a cave on a small island, and Olver, for unclear reasons, tries to kill Finbogi while Finbogi is making their fire. Well, Finbogi ends up uh, wrestling him and impaling him on a rock in the cave wall. Oddly enough, his next stop, having heard where Ulver is from, is Ulver's own home on his own island. He goes there and he tells uh, Ulver's wife, Ingibjorg, that he has been sent by Ulver to bring their daughter Ragnhildr to Trondheim, the Norwegian capital at the time where Håkon Jarl rules. And as quote-unquote proof, he offers that the daughter had often asked to go and never been allowed, and that is somehow accepted as proof by both of them. So he grabs the daughter, Ragnhildr, who's a young woman of about his age apparently, rows over to the island where he killed her dad, tells her that he killed her dad, but he assures her uh, that he will not nidask on her. He will not um, do something to make himself a nidinger, a hated man, a man of of ill fame, bad reputation. All right. Well, now he does bring her to Trondheim from there with all the loot that uh, her dad had left on the island. 
drops her off with some relatives in Trondheim, and then goes before Hakon Yar, the ruler, and tells him that he has killed Olver. Well, Olver is a servant of Hakon, and uh, Ingebjorg is in fact a close relative of the ruler. So he says that he's going to try to kill uh, Finbogi, but since Finbogi has kind of impressed him, he's going to do it in an awesome way. He's not just going to execute him. He says the first, he's going to put him through several tests, right? He's going to kind of movie villain his death. And his first test is going to have to wrestle a blah mother. Now, literal meaning of that would be blue man. Old Norse calls what English calls uh, black in human skin color blue. Now, notice that people who are called black in English are not typically, you know, like black like my hat, right? Just like white, what, what are called white people in English are not typically, you know, white like a sheet of paper. When languages use colors in classificatory ways, they usually use much more basic terms than would actually be, apply, right? So white and black skin instead of pink and brown skin. Or the same way with uh, red and white wine rather than, you know, purple and yellow wine. So Old Norse um, just defaults to blue rather than black, and who can say exactly why? I have some speculations about it um, in my dissertation about color, if anybody cares. So he wrestles the Blomother who serves Hulk and Jarl, and the Blomother becomes the next victim of Finboogie's break his back on a rock trick. Finboogie's next test is to Reina Sund, which literally looks like try swimming, but in a Norse context, this means try killing somebody while swimming. <laughs> and he's not going to fight another man, he's going to fight Hawkon's pet bear, who understands commands in Norse. So they swim out into the ocean and wrestle, <laughs> and uh, along the way, uh, Finbogi almost uh, is, is, is gotten the upper hand of, uh, by the bear, but then he remembers the knife that his mother gave him that he wears around his neck, and he uses that to stab the bear. And then he does a bunch of swimming and diving tricks to impress all, everybody back on shore. So in appreciation of his prowess, Hakon accepts him as one of his followers in the place of Olver, who Finbogi had killed. Now, his next adventure is the Jarl gives him a mission to go to Constantinople and demand payment from a man who owes the Jarl, the ruler of Norway, money. This adventure is chiefly remembered today because of a cool exchange that uh, Finbogi has with the emperor there. When the emperor, a Christian, asks him, O wherein truer thou? Who do you believe in? And Finbogi replies, Ek trui o sjolvan mik. I believe in myself. Now don't get too excited about that. He is not what TV Tropes calls a flat earth atheist. Uh, he is what the Icelandic sagas consistently call a godless man, which doesn't mean atheist, it means pagan godless man. It's someone who, who couldn't have realistically have known about Christianity, or well, he can because of Constantinople, but he can't realistically have been exposed to it in a context in which he'd be converted. But he doesn't believe in the pagan gods. And so his transition to Christianity, if he does get converted eventually, is going to go through a stage where he doesn't believe in the pagan gods. So he doesn't believe in any gods that he knows about, but it doesn't mean that he rejects the idea there could be a god. He's ready to be a Christian is, is the, the, the trope. All right. He goes back to Norway and ends up marrying Roggenhilder Ulf's dotir. Um, this is this whole weird scene here where they go back to the island where Olver and, and Ingebjörg and Roggenhilder are from. And the Jarl makes Ingebjörg through a wedding feast for the guy to be married to her daughter that killed her husband. Um, but she's so impressed with how handsome Finbogi is and uh, all the wealth and reputation he'll bring to the family that, that she eventually is okay with it. And then in the typical way of Icelandic saga heroes, even though he has an awesome life with the king, or not king, but Jarl ruler, back in Norway, he goes home. And I guess I understand that. Um, at home, uh, he ends up having a fair amount of different feuds with neighbors, you know, everybody wants to test themselves against the fastest gun in the West, the fastest sword in Iceland. Um, you know, all this stuff, it, it, it ends up kind of washing together. But he does live uh, in his new farm in Iceland near a guy who is called a troll. 
um, who he his name Thorvald or Moskeg, um, Thorvald Mud Hay Beard, and uh, this troll figure is often made fun of by the uh, five and three year old son that Fimbulgi and Ragnhildr have had by this point in the story, and one day he bashes them against rocks and kills them for making fun of him. So Finbogi kills him, but Roggenhilder uh, dies out of her heartbreak uh, shortly thereafter. Now, not long after this, Finbogi is going to remarry again to a Hullfrether, and we're going to have a somewhat convoluted typical saga situation where his new wife's nephew gets into a feud with a neighbor named Jokul over a woman, and this same feud is described from the other party's perspective in Vaden's Dilla Saga. Because Yuckel is one of the uh, protagonist family there. Now, Finbogi is friends with Yokel's other brothers, but Yokel himself and his many cronies abuse Finbogi's family hard until Yokel challenges Finbogi to a formal home ganga or duel. And alongside him in solidarity, um, uh, Yokel's brother Thorstein challenges. Um, Finbogi's nephew, Berger, note this is not the nephew-in-law who started this whole stupid fight. It's a totally different family member to a duel as well. Well, Berger's wife is a witch, and she doesn't want her her husband and his uncle to get killed in a duel, even though Finbogi surely wouldn't. So she causes a snowstorm to come up and prevent them from getting to the place in time where the duel is appointed to be. Now, Jokul is so disgusted and he makes a neath stong, a pole of neath, of, of hate, of slander. And uh, this is told in more detail in Vatans de la Saga, which again has many of these scenes told from the other party's perspective, where we read that there's a sheep shed near the dueling ground, and Jokul and his brother take a pole out of it, and Jokul carves a man's face on top. Then he kills a mare who has been sheltering out of the storm in the sheep shed, and he cuts her open down her barrel, and he puts her on top of the pole facing Berger's house, from the direction of the house. And after that, he carves in runes, Han, meaning Berger, he, Skal vera huersmans nidinger, ok vera huergi i samlagi god ramana, ok hava goda gremi, ok gred nidings naven. He shall be the nidinger, the hated man, slandered man of every man, and he will never be in company with good men, and he will have the anger of the gods and the name of a uh, person to be slandered for breaking a, an agreement, Grid Nithinger. Well, this, of course, uh, is not going to go uh, get any better. And later, uh, Yokel's going to kill Berger in a separate ambush. And Finbogi is going to wind up... Uh, I think he moves again, trying to get away from Yokel. They don't. They don't have a. Uh, they don't. They don't keep fighting. A few years pass, and eventually, uh, Finbogi winds up having uh, two men sent to his farm by Yokel, who are sent to kill him. And they're both really transparent. They both show up and they say, "Hey, I came from that way. I'm just a wandering guy. I'm an outlaw. Would you shelter me?" Um, I'm really good at some particular farm skill. One says he's great at making fences. One says he's great at making hay. Finbogi goes out to have him prove their skill, pretends to fall asleep while they're working, and then each one tries to kill him, and he kills them when they do. But finally, a third outlaw comes, uh, and this is Veramunder, and it looks like it's going to go the same way, but Veramunder actually sticks. He doesn't attack Finbogi, and uh, ends up being a great asset to the farm, and it turns out he was outlawed by a neighbor named Bronder, and Veramunder had killed one of Bronder's relatives in a fight. Now, Bronder's not going to take it sitting down that Finbogi is sheltering this man, so he rides to Finbogi's farm, meaning to kill Veramunder. Finbogi's at home, and he and Veramunder put together a defense. They, they get ready on top of a ridge to fight off Bronder and his men, but they both express their admiration for what a good man, a good dranger Bronder is. Uh, Veramunder says, you know, he's a dranger go there, a good dranger. Fimbogi agrees and says, he is, yeah, dranger go there, and he will perhaps honor some similig bow, some honorable offer. So they go out to meet him at the top of a, at the top of this ridge, and Bronder and Finbogi actually have a pretty polite conversation about this. And uh, Finbogi says he's 
not going to give Verminder up, not even if Bronder offers to, to release him from any kind of legal punishment. And he says that if Bronder comes any closer, he's going to have to fight Finn Boogie and all of his farm hands, each one of which is named Stain or Stone. And what Finn, Finn Boogie means is he's going to throw, he's going to throw rocks at Bronder. Bronder's so impressed by Finn Boogie's sand that he makes terms with him right then and there. It's great, fine. And they end up all being uh, buddies. Verminder even returns to Bronder's farm with him instead of going back to Finn Boogie's. And at the next thing, because Bronder is influential with both of them, he makes peace between Finn Boogie and Yokel. And Finn Boogie manages to live to old age and die peacefully at his home. So I managed to take something that's pretty episodic and long and, and, and try to bring it down to a somewhat digestible structure, focusing a lot on the kind of fun elements of Finn Boogie's earlier life, but trying to wrap in some of these later episodes uh, that are interesting too. I hope that's been interesting or enjoyable for you in some way. And from beautiful Colorado, let me wish you all the best.